All right, so I guess I should do my introduction. You'll see a little bit more of this in detail on one of the slides. Um, I've been investing in Fresno for 15 years. So I started actually in 2003. So last seller's market, anybody, anybody remember the last five years? So I invested in 2003 up through the crash, through the crash and, and back. So we'll, we'll talk about all of that today and what that felt like, all of that. Um, I have just shy of 200 units today. Uh, started with a single family home on Norris Drive, which we have a story about, I will tell you. Did a bunch of 1031 exchanges. We'll go through the whole story here. Uh, but basically, I did what a lot of you said. I had a day job. I worked for technology companies in the Silicon Valley selling software. I was a commissioned sales rep, commissioned sales manager, commissioned sales VP. So I ran things from the West Coast to the country to the world. So I know what it's like to travel and build this as a side hustle. Uh, and I successfully replaced my wife's income five years ago, or now six years ago, and replaced my income about 18 months ago. So I left the rat race at 45 because of Fresno rental properties. Uh, so we're going to talk about how that happened and all of that. Uh, the last thing to say is I used to present for a living. Uh, so I'm here for you. So if you have a question or something doesn't make sense, just do, just do me a favor and raise your hand. And hopefully we interact. If I go 20 minutes and I'm the only one talking, I might have fun with you and just stop and ask somebody a question. So it might be better for you to ask me questions so I don't call on you by accident, Michael. I'm just saying. He was with me before. So um, is that fair? Does that make sense? Can, and you can hear me OK, right? Yep. Awesome. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Um, I actually start all of my meetups now talking about uncomfortable truths. I think getting excited about real estate investing is easy to do, right? That adrenaline we all feel, we start to vibrate at this low rate, right? But there's some uncomfortable truths that if we let them consume us, can just take us out of it. So we're just going to talk about them. There's actually more than this, but I like to talk about these five. Just a level set kind of who I am and, and the kind of value you're going to get out of today. I, am, I did create one slide on our story from a single house to financial freedom. So we'll go through that in detail. Um, I do have keys to success because Stratton was nice enough to prep me on this group who was going to be here. So I thought about it and I created my keys to success, what I would hope to in part. Because 16 years ago, I was you in a chair. Right? I started back in 03, but I was coming to meetups in 2002, just like you going, I don't know anything. I want to network. I want to meet folks. So I know what it feels like um, to be you sitting in a chair listening to someone, because I was you 16 or 17 years ago. So I want to tell you what I think the keys are just starting out. Um, the other thing is I talk to a lot of new people that get stuck. They feel like they're being active. right? They're going, I'm busy, but they are not making progress. Do you know what I mean? Being busy, but no progress. So I have four questions. It says three, but there's actually, oh, it said, no, it doesn't say three anymore. There's four questions that I'm going to propose to you. And if you can answer at least three of them, you're in good shape. But if you can't answer them, that's self-reflection time. It's like, OK, I got to stop being busy and feeling good. I need, to, I need to have a direction. So we're going to talk about that today. I'm going to highlight some early mistakes. It's great to sit here and talk with you. And I can tell you all these great stories about all these great units. But that would not do you any good. I got to tell you about the mistakes I made at the beginning and the things that I would do different. Uh, I do have some core beliefs, which are different than keys to success, because I think you have to be, if you're going to be in this people business, you have to have some core things that you hold on to. So we're going to talk about those. Um, as Stratton said, we're going to talk about getting to four. Right? What is the keys to getting to four, going from zero to four? So we're going to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to talk about what happens after I left the rat race, because you know, this was February 1st of 18. What am I doing since? I am doing a couple of fun things, often talking at meetups and on a YouTube channel and the like. So we'll talk about that. Uh, I did a blog today for Bigger Pockets and actually a video that I'll post, what is today, Monday? It'll post Wednesday on what I would do if I had to start over. So if I was you in a chair with zero, what would I do? So we'll talk about that. I brought that special just for you. Uh, and then I heard some of you want to, might want to talk about raising private money. So I thought I would give you my keys there. And then the last thing is everything I do out now, learn more and follow me and all that good stuff. Cool? cool. And how much time do we have? I heard we got like two hours. We have as much time as we Fucking awesome. There you go. I can talk. <laughs> all right, so uncomfortable truths, number one. Everybody I've ever met, I was a commissioned salesperson for a long time, usually a 50-50 split, which if you don't know what that means, it means I had a base and I had commission. 
and the commission, I had variable, so I can make a lot of money. Lots of people like to talk about the income number. I'm here to tell you, as somebody who left the rat race, it's not about the income number, right? It's about making sacrifices, living below your means. Uh, I call it here playing good defense. For me, what I had to get my head wrapped around, because when I, I had this come, come to, I had this epiphany at 30, that I was, I was making a six-figure salary but spending everything, right? I was, I was living paycheck to paycheck. And what I had to do is I had to start living on less. So instead of living you know, at the razor's edge, we eventually got down to where we were living on 50% of our income. Why that's key is because I was then able to earn, save, invest, right? So it's that, it's that uh, ratio. People don't like to talk about in this Facebook and Instagram world, they always like to talk about the six-figure paychecks and all that fancy stuff. If you, if you can understand what a need and a want is, you can really get good at this game because you cut out the wants. You sacrifice. We had to sacrifice for 15 years, but now we can have all the fun toys we want, right? So um, you have to do that. I'm sorry. It, sacrifice is key. Here's another one. How many of you have shiny object syndrome? In real estate investing, all of you should be raising your hands, or at least most of you. Wholesaling today, flipping tomorrow, note investing, mobile homes, lots, fire damage. I mean, god damn, there's like 17,000 things you could do. Stop it. I'm here to tell you, you only have to get good at one thing in this business. And that can retire you from your day job. When you're out of the rat race and you want to pick up more stuff, go for it. I retired from the rat race. I replaced two six-figure incomes as a buy and hold landlord. Now that we are both done, we picked up flipping and we, we replaced our income again. But we didn't do any of that other stuff until we were out. Only have so much time in the day. We have a growing family. I traveled all over the world. Crazy life. We did one thing. So stop the shiny object. If you're new and you don't know yet, go kick some tires. But pick one. And then like dedicate 90 days minimum. Don't do Monday this, Tuesday that, Wednesday this. Feel me? We good? We're OK so far? I'm not scaring anybody? All right. Your personal network matters. How many of you talked to your friends today and said you're going to a real estate meetup tonight? That's it? You all don't have friends? Seriously, how many of you told somebody in your network you were going to a real estate meetup today? Wow, OK, fine. Well, when I was doing this, I was telling everybody I was going to go to a meetup. And I found out very quickly who was negative in my group. I just told them I was going to a meetup. And I got a 30-minute diarrhea of why real estate is bad, why it's going to steal my money, why I shouldn't waste my time. I should stick with stocks or some you know, cars or I don't know, some crazy stuff. If there are people in your world that don't like your vision, don't like what's possible, cut them out. Now, some of you, at least in my case, they were family members and like close family members. So you can't quite cut them out, but you can reduce that noise. That's a hard thing to do. I get it. But if you can just replace one negative person with a positive person, somebody that's here today, for example, that is also at a meetup, that positive juice you get from friends, just the handshakes we get coming in, right? That's awesome. You, you need to pick me up in this business. You're going to have lots of bad days. I'm sorry. But if you have friends that have been there too, you're going to be doing OK. So always, always, always evaluate your close network. In my case, I had two people that were really, really close to me that I had to eventually cut out. They were negative and always negative. Even when I was successful, they still told me I was going to lose everything. Forget it. Gone. Right? I'm sorry. It's one of the, again, uncomfortable truths. Told you this stuff was coming. Bad things happen. If you are going to be a buy and hold landlord, and I've been one for now 16 years, I'm here to tell you that bad stuff happens. Tenants don't always pay. General contractors don't always do what they say. Stuff breaks. Mother nature is a bitch. You know, roofs leak. Right? Bad stuff happens. Right? Just know. And not, not that you have to expect it, but don't get so high and so low. If you can, if you can condense your highs and lows, you're going to survive in this business a lot longer. 
right? If you that's something I learned back from selling software where I would make hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially. If I could just balance the highs and lows, I would last a lot longer instead of just freaking out all the time. And the last one I want to put out here is anyone, 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 anyone in this room can be successful. I've interviewed high school dropouts. I've in interviewed felons. I've interviewed people who started at 50. I've interviewed a teenager right, that has to have get dad or mom to co-sign. Anyone, anyone, anyone who's willing to put in the work and follow the process can be successful in this business. Okay? How are these uncomfortable truths? You guys still like me? Anybody want to leave? No? We're okay? All right. Let's have some fun. So here's my story. I'll go through it quickly. It all changed for me on my 30th birthday. Uh, I always self-evaluate. I've just, I've always been wired this way. I'm in sales, right? First of the year, January, thereabouts, I set my yearly goals. July, my birthday's in July. I reassess where I'm at and I go forward. So around the 30, my 30th birthday, I go, what am I doing? I'm, I did what my parents called successful. How many of your parents said, go to school, get a good education, get a good job, make lots of money, and you're successful? That was my family. And here's the deal. My family, there, I mean, mom, dad, cousins, aunts, uncles, nobody in my family other than myself has a college degree. Right? They, they generally served in the military or were high school dropouts. When you look at my family tree, you see white trash, like trailers, mobile homes, right? I mean, like, like meth heads. That's, that's my family tree. Seriously, that, that's who's in my family, like cousins and like bad stuff. So I was, I was the successful one at 30 making six figures. But I knew that I, I couldn't keep running this fast for much longer. I was going to blow up, have a heart attack, get addicted to drugs, something, right? Because you've got to replace that. So I realized, and then I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Who in here has not read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? You, are you, serious? you are going to fix that, right? Yeah, obviously. It's reading Good to Great and then Rich Dad. No, I'm serious. If you have not read that book, it is the only book I've ever read cover to cover five times in a row. It fundamentally changed my life. It is not a great written book. It's not going to win any Pulitzer Prizes. But the mind shifts from the get a good job, get a good education, you know, you're successful to, hey, control your world, passive income, rentals, buy and hold, it changed my life. If you don't buy that book, like, in the next 48 hours, I'm going to come find you. <laughs> yes, sir? Would you recommend the cash flow quadrant? It kind of says the same thing, but... Uh, I've read, I read every one of his books. Rich Dad, Poor Dad is the only book I've read five times in a row. All the other ones are regurgitation and marketing pieces. The other one I read twice was Reti Retire Young, Retire Rich or retire rich, one of those ways. The only one I recommend is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's got three or four mind shifts in it. Yeah, cash flow positive. Yeah, that talks about, you know, on this side of the equation. No, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. Only one I recommend. Okay? So I was a busy tech professional who, oh, by the way, hates to fly. I'm a nervous flyer. I've done, I've done red eyes to Japan, can't sleep. You can try to drug me. It doesn't work because I feel every bump. I'm, I literally like grab the handles. I'm a freaked out flyer, but it's the only way I made any money, so I did it. Um, the other thing um, is I had a growing family growing up, right? And family was important to me. You know, we have one daughter. It was important for me to help raise her. I had her young. I was a teenager. Um, but it was important for me to put food on the table and all of that. But do you know what it takes to get a platinum reward card for Marriott's hotel? It's the worst day of my life. Seriously. I, they sent me this. It's like, it looks like a credit card, but it weighs like a pound. It's like made out of titanium or some garbage. It's like really heavy. It's like, thank you very much. You spent 100 nights in our hotel this year. That was the worst day of my life because I stay at other hotels. And to think that I just ate at Marriott 100 times, and then I was at Hilton and Radisson and all these others, I was like, I need this. My life's over, right? So that, that's not good. So I had a busy life is the point. And I still built this buy and hold rental property. So another thing, I don't think I've said this yet. I actually live in Mountain View, California. If you don't know where that is, think Google. Like I'm literally a mile from the Google Googleplex. And I've been in, I've lived in, I grew up in Sunnyvale, and I lived in Cupertino and Mountain View, right? So I'm a Bay Area kid. I tried to invest in the, my backyard because every real estate book said back in 2002, invest 30 minutes from home. Anybody ever hear that? I tried. Doesn't always work, right? So 
uh, we eventually, uh, after a year, literally 52 Sundays, because every Sunday my wife, Olivia, um, who's not here today, but she usually comes with me, every Sunday for 52 weeks we drive around the Bay Area because we were certain that all the books would be right and that eventually we would find the, the street where cash flow would exist. Didn't work out. So we pulled out the California map, we started drawing circles, and lo and behold, Fresno popped out. Two and a half hours from where I live. I have to drive two and a half hours home after this is over. Right? So it's a five hour trip to look at one house. That's how committed we were. Right? And the other fact that's often funny for folks is I have never spent a night in Fresno. Why? Why? I like sleeping in my own bed. Did you see how many nights I spend in hotels? You think I need another night in a hotel? <laughs> Yeah, it's literally, that's it. I would rather drive home and get home at midnight or 1 a.m. than spend another freaking night in a hotel. It's like not going to happen, right? So again, that's Fresno. Um, the other thing that I'll point out here just because we have time is about 2008, 2009, we were probably at about 80 doors. The market was kind of shaky, if you remember. This is right before it rolled over and got nutty. I actually went out to Texas and Nevada, Utah, Arizona, trying to see if I wanted to create another team. And I'm like, nope, I'm committed to Fresno. I'm going to stay in California. I'm going to go for it. I didn't want to build another team. It's so, the, the riskiest thing being a buy and hold landlord, especially out of area, is the team. And once you invest the time creating a team, you don't want to let that go. I fired the first five property managers I had. There's nothing worse than being out of the area, having to come see your property manager and saying, you're fired. Give me the keys. Give me the leases over, right? We fired one a year. It averaged about nine months. That's hard. So once you find a property manager, and I've been with the firm I'm now with over a decade, you're not, you're not going anywhere. And so the property managers, would you hand them over to the new ones? Would you only hand over certain amounts? Like properties? I was talking to Alan, right? Yeah. He was like, I handed them over, I, I think he handed them over 18 units. Yeah. Like they, it was a disaster. And he was like, I'm so glad I did not handle my entire portfolio because yeah. it's shit. Yeah. So, I don't have that option. Alan lives here in Fresno and has that option to say, I'm going to keep the good ones and give them the ugly ones. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that option. I never wanted to talk to my tenants. Sorry. I want that ring fence. I don't want a phone call. I could be in Japan for all places or Australia or Chile. Who knows? I don't want to. I don't want to no. I had no option. Since day one, since having one house, I've had a property manager. And have they how bad have they messed it up, right, in that aspect of, like, a capital aspect, the leases? Well, they've, five of them got fired. And now you have Brad. And now I have Brad. It's tough, right? It's, property manager is that thing, and I, I talk about it. I teach how to build a team and manage a team, and that's one of them is the property manager. Yeah? Who else is on that team? So property manager is, again, as a buy and hold, out-of-town investor, property manager number one. Why? Because when you find the right ones and that's their job, they're going to give you a ring fence to GCs, to realtors, to insurance people. They're going to help with that. But you as an individual, you need to network as well. One a personal goal I had when I was in your chairs is to try to meet two new people a week. You do that for 12 or 13 years, your network's pretty cool. right? So even if you just met one new person a week, like sitting in the chair and you don't know anything, you're going to learn a lot more in 52 weeks. So that's something I did. But yeah, I would add realtors and bankers. Yes, ma'am. Super random, but I wanted oh. to know why you didn't talk to tenants. Why you personally didn't talk to tenants. And only had to manage responsibility. I don't want the headache. I don't want them to know who I am. I am a very, I have this outer candy shell that I like to pretend I'm all hard and tough, but I'm an ooey gooey center and I have feelings. So I don't want to talk to somebody um, who owes me rent and hear some sob story and say, OK, you can live there for free. Because that's probably what I would do. I want to pay a property manager to be the badass and say no all the time. So that's, that's the real answer. I wish I could be all tough. And, but I don't, I don't want to hear the sob stories because I grew up dirt poor. And I know what it's like when dad's not working and mom's a stay-at-home mom. And you got to make a choice between electricity and food. I, I, I have those memories. I don't want to have those tough conversations, frankly. That probably doesn't make me cool, but that's the truth. That's a real what are some of the red flags that, that you wanted to dispose of the, your property? So the biggest one that got me, and this is only on reflection, is sometimes when you are a property manager, that's a side job. right? You get that 8 or 9 or 10%, but your main job is a real estate broker or maybe a money lender. 
So when the market goes up or down and when one side is busy or not busy, their focus moves. So like when the crash happened and suddenly they become the short sale person, they're going to do all of that and they're not going to be doing their job with property management. Or, you know, that's, that's the big one for me now is I want the owner of the company to be an investor. And I don't want them to only own their house. I want the owner to own dozens of units because I want them to put this in place. And I don't want them to be a realtor. Right? They can have realtors in their arm. I want the owner to be an investor because they're going to think like an investor. The reports will be like investors. That's what's important to me. Who do you use now? Regency Properties. Brad Hardy's team. I know Regency. So two questions. Sure. One, Like no dogs, you know, three times. Cool. So um, property managers, I didn't have a questionnaire in the beginning. I should have. Uh, for me, when I go out, and if I were to do it today, I would ask about the principal. Tell me about the owner. How long have they lived, in this case, Fresno? Right? Have they lived here ever, or were they an expat from LA or the Bay Area, and they've been here seven seconds? Right? Is, in this case, Brad, right? his dad, his family, they've been here for generations. Right? How many units do they own? What are they doing today, right? Did, they, did their dad buy them or mom buy them and give it to them and they're just milking them? Are they buying new stuff, right? What are they looking at? Are they only looking at high end? Are they doing low end? Where are they? I would try to figure out as much as I could about the owner. Then it would be, okay, who am I gonna be working with, right? Do I get one throat to choke so one person sends me reports or I'm in, am I some big pool and on Monday I talk to Mary and on Thursday I talk to Jose and on Wednesday is Sally. Right? How do I get structure? And then when do I get my reports? And what's the, evic what's the process? Right? And not only what's the process for a problem tenant, but what's the process to, to reward a good tenant? That's the big one. If you can keep good tenants a year longer, your being a landlord would be so much more successful. Most landlords make a mistake. They only want to think about the bad tenants. 98%-ish of my tenants are awesome. 1% need some babysitting, and the other 1% are freaking crooks, right? So we, everybody knows about the 1%, right? Because the California law says how you take care of them. So don't tell me about that. I get it. Three-day you know, three notice, then evict. Got it. But how am I going to reward the 98%? Most property managers don't want to talk about that, and most investors don't know to ask about that. That's what I would do. Did I answer that question? And now as far as tenants, you have to be really, really careful on your rules. So I have a box that we fit in. And my property managers, they run through the checkbox. I think it's three times income, no evictions in the last 24 months, dogs under 10 pounds, I think. Um, and I forget the rest, but define your box. And then if they fit, they fit. And if they don't, they don't. Because you don't want to be sued. Bad, bad, bad. When you say reward or take care of your tenants, mm -hmm. you mean like it, raising rents on them? So, so in the past, if you have paid me rent on time for 12 months in a row, uh, there's a very good chance, unless you've never had a rent increase for three or four years, you won't get a rent increase. Uh, if you've been there three years in a row and have had no missed rents, I'll likely paint a bedroom or replace carpet or some, I will do some capital expense, right? Because I want to keep that person, right? I will spend hundreds of dollars to keep them. No eviction, I mean, that's like, that's true mailbox money. The more people that's real mailbox money, I will, I will spend hundreds of dollars. An eviction is $1,000. So if somebody pays me three years in a row, shoot, heck yeah, I'll paint their house, or I'll paint the interior again, no problem, 675, 750, whatever, done, right? We're doing good so far? Awesome, keep the questions coming because I don't want to talk forever. Uh, oh, first rental experience. Uh, so here's the deal. So I already told you we spent 52 weeks, remember every Sunday? Then we come to Fresno. I find this house on Norris Drive, 1818 Norris Drive, East 93703. You can look it up on Zillow. I bought it for 107 grand. It rented for 10.95. I didn't know any different, so I put 20% down. I had the money, I had the credit, I didn't know what else to do, because that's what you do, right? You always put 20% down. I don't know. So it cash flows. I get them in. We we think we're going to get 10.95. We get 10.95. They move in two weeks later. We are. So, I mean, we celebrate. We pop champagne. Like we think we've got it, right? I mean, we're like. Ex I mean, like. I, w I wish I could bottle that feeling up because I've never had it again. I mean, it's that exciting, right? Because yeah, a year we spent looking for this freaking thing. <sighs> then bad stuff happens. 
Husband and wife split up two weeks into moving into my place. The wife takes off. We hear Arizona, could have been New Mexico. We don't know. We never hear from her again. Husband decides he's not very happy with this situation. Decides to stop working and become a professional drinker. Doesn't pay rent. Decides to create a wine wall, which means take an empty wine bottle and crash it through my drywall. And because I'm in California, it takes me two months to get rid of them. So we spend a year looking for this place. We pop champagne. We get first month and deposit, and not a penny more. After about 90 days, maybe it was 100 days of them moving in, he's out. We now get a, a bill for 15 grand to repair it. You think his deposit covered that? No. So I bring this up because most people I talk to, they would have sold that Fresno house in a heartbeat. They would have taken a loss. Think about it. You and your significant other have spent a year looking for something local. You decide on Fresno because that's what the California map says. Oh, by the way, I'd never been to Fresno except one time when I drove to Yosemite at 13. I knew no one. I, it still shocks me that my wife didn't say, sell that thing, move on. But no, we had a conversation. She goes, that's not supposed to happen. You know, tough situation, blah, blah, blah. Let's keep going. Oh, by the way, Norris Drive goes on to be a great story. That property goes from 107 to 269 or 67 if somebody sees it in Zillow. We do a 1031 exchange out of that. We move 150 grand into a five unit building that we still own today. All right, so it has a great story. But think about that start. Come on in. Good. Real estate. Yes. In the right place. Hey, man, how are you? Michael. Sorry. It's all right, man. Don't worry about it. You can find me. Um, so again, think about if you're new to this business, how would that first buy and hold experience work in your family, work in your relationship? And you'll see later in the discussion, you need to be on the same page with your significant other, your investment partner, however you're doing this. Because while your first experience, I pray and hope, is not as bad as mine, somewhere in your investing career, a bad day is going to happen. And you can't have somebody who's 98% in and 2% out come back and start nagging or going, hey, I told you so, and this or that. Be in or out. Yes? How did you handle the I told you so? It never happened. She's been on board since day one. Never. Not, not from her, but from everybody else. Again, you need to have that up front. You need to, tell, you need to get good at this Norris Drive story and tell them that this could happen. So I'm saying you had a lot of friends and oh, family yeah. questioned you. Oh, yeah. I come from a family where everybody's a genius. <laughs> I think they are. Yeah. What, how do you handle the people that go, Michael, I told you so. You wasted a year. Um, Did you cut all of them out? So again, that's part of, yeah, part of my uncomfortable truth. People had to be removed from the discussion. I just stopped talking. If like my mom was, was on board, my dad was actually the negative one. Um, I just stopped talking to him about, first of all, you can't talk about money because all he's ever done is spend everything in his checking account so he doesn't know what savings is. But yeah, so you just stop talking to some people, even if they're in your family. Just you need to have that you fortitude. Because you always talk about document your story. Yeah. And part of your story is the failures. So how, how yeah. did you handle documenting your failures? So first off, I document everything. I'll do this. I'll cover, I'll cover documenting a story on one of my last slides. But knowing and being 100% honest with who you are and what's going on and the bad stories and now celebrating Nora's Drive, you know, it, it, you got to put it all out there, the good and bad. And what really happens when you're in this long enough is the good dwarfs the bad. But here's the deal. If you only talk about the roses and not the manure, people aren't going to believe you. They're not going to believe you. So have those stories, because they will happen to all of us. They may not be that horrific, like happened to us on our first deal. And here's the other thing. I've had thousands of tenants, and I only have two stories like that. It sucks that my first house was one of them, and the other one was in an apartment building. If you want, we can talk about it at the end. But um, that first one would have crushed most people. And when Olivia's in the room, I go, thank you, honey. And I'll just go, thank you, honey, for keeping going. She gets all the credit in the world. So again, 15 years, we ran. So again, we started in 03 which was kind of through 07, 08, depending on how you look at the charts, which was even a crazier seller's market than what we've seen the last five years. Think about that. 
Who's been doing this for less than five years? Here's the deal. If you've only been doing this for the last five years, you only know the sun. It's about to get stormy. I know what it's like in the sun and in the worst hurricane, tornado, fire, the 08 to like 10. Nasty. Right? So I can talk about all that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So this is about the first house? OK, great. I just want to make sure. Um, so we were committed. We didn't know if we could. We, we believed that real estate investing was our path to financial freedom. We both knew that our high tech jobs, um, we could do them, but they'd also kill us early. They're that stressful, that many hours, all of that. <coughs> and. We didn't want that for each other. And she always knew I was gone. She had a job where she was an accountant, so she was home helping raise our daughter. But I, I was gone half the year. And that, that's, we like each other. So we, wanted, we believed that real estate was our path. We were not going to create a company. We weren't going to write music. We weren't athletes. We weren't going to create something. Our only path as the average human being was real estate. We fundamentally, that was the one tenet that we believed, was real estate was our only chance. And we, talk, we talked all the time. We just kept going. For, that's, hence the story, one rental at a time. We was, oh, just kept rolling to the next one. And that was really the, the crux of our belief. Did we, we, we didn't know, right? We had, we had no family members that had ever done anything in real estate. We had no family members that were entrepreneurs. We had very few that graduated high school, right? So, but we just had this unquestionable belief that real estate would be the way. And it didn't start well, obviously. <laughs> Um, so again, we did the last seller's market. We rolled over in the depression, and we've been through the return. So I call it a cycle and a half. Happy to talk about any part of that if we go, when we get into Q&A, because it's a lot of fun. Who in here does not know what a 1031 exchange is? Awesome. So here's the deal. One of the things you're going to see with real estate is you have all these little tax things that you can use to your benefit. What happens today when you sell an asset like a stock and make a profit? Who gets a piece? Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam, the IRS, whatever you want to call it, right? Here's the beauty of owning real estate that appreciates. You can sell it in something called a 1031 tax deferred exchange. It's an IRS code. There are a bunch of time limits and rules, so read them later. But here's the deal. I told you about Norris Drive, right? <coughs> we bought it for 107, told, say we sold it for 270. We had a gain of 163, is that right? Yeah, 163. We did a 1031 exchange and paid the IRS zero. What happens is you sell it, you take the profit, you hold it in this little intermediary, you create this other thing, this like kind exchange, and you move the equity over to the new thing. So we sold a house, we exchanged, correct me, we exchanged a house for a five unit apartment building and paid Uncle Sam zero. Do that with a stock. You can't, right? So you still have that? I do. Okay. Yep. It's on Vassar. Yep. Are you using opportunities on the I've looked at them. Uh, I, am, I own stuff in them, actually. Right. You own Accidentally. Stuff. Yeah, I've actually bought more stuff there. You own more stuff in opportunity zones. And I was talking to Pritchard about it. He's, I think he started one. Uh, I, um, I do not like the requirements of an opportunity zone. I don't, like the I, I don't like the lock-in, no. But I've looked. But I don't like the lock-in. I don't like any time the government tells me I, what I have to do. I, I fucking have a fundamental problem with that. It's just like irks me to my core. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the other thing is we never sold anything other than if you read my book, I actually sold one by, mis by accident. When the Everybody know this $8,000 tax credit that came out in like 2009? Everybody remember that? So back in 2009, real estate was falling off a cliff. And Obama and who was the treasury guy? Anybody remember? Greenspan? No, after Green. Anyway, some other white guy goes, we have to save real estate. It's falling off a cliff. It's going bad. So what they said is if you buy a new house, we're going to give you $8,000 back on your taxes. Everybody. This is something the government did because real estate was so bad. So what happens here is, and I'm, again, I just tell everything. So I bought a house right before that was announced. This $8,000 tax credit comes out. My property doubles in escrow. 
So I close escrow at, say, 80. I sell it for 160 30 days later, just because the government gave me this artificial bump, because everybody wanted real estate for like seven days. That's the only thing we ever sold for 15 years. Other than that, I was buy and hold. Didn't flip, didn't wholesale, nothing. If you were to ask me to sell something back then, I'd tell you, you kidding me, a deal is so hard to find, I'm not selling anything, right? Other than that one exception. Cool? Again, Olivia retired five years ago. I left February of 18. Uh, now we spend our time giving back. We do turn slumlord properties uh, today into pride of ownership. We buy them cash, spend 40 or 50 grand, and then we sell them to new landlords, uh, typically from the Bay Area and my network. So that's what we do. That's our story. So keys to success, being bought in together. <laughs> if you ever have a question about whether or not you were bought in together, tell the version of the Norris Drive story. How, and how that ends will tell you if you're bought in together or not. Olivia was bought in uh, even more than I, I knew at the time, and that story only strengthened it. Uh, another thing is we bought deals all the time. People, always are, people now are telling me, hey, Michael, you've been doing this a while. Should I wait for the crash? How many of you are thinking about, hey, I'm going to get smart. I'm going to wait for the crash. Come on now, be honest. Oh, you guys are liars. <laughs> With uh, apartments, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, multis are freaking ridiculous. But yeah, here's the deal. We were buy and hold investors. We had this story one minute at a time. I bought something about every six months um, of our career because I'm not smart enough to time a market. If you are doing your math and you understand it only by good or great deals, it doesn't matter. And I'll get into what a good or a great deal is in a minute. I use conservative financing, fixed rate debt, you know, all that stuff. Do the deal. Um, I don't think you can really time the market, especially today. Interest rates are in the four. I did deals as high as 12. Today, interest rates, if you don't own anything, could be in the fours. Oh, you're killing me. I can't get those. I own too much. Uh, I, another thing that's important, when I look back at our career, the one thing I did well, and it's just kind of how I'm wired, is I'm an early morning person, and I spent 60 minutes every day for 10 years looking at the Fresno market. And here's the deal. I knew no one. I had no MLS access. I simply used Realtor.com. Right? I started by understanding our criteria, looking at that every day, documenting it, seeing how it changed. Right? There was a time where I could talk about the Mayfair or the Tower or downtown better than real estate agents that lived in Fresno because I looked every day for 10 years, at still least do. once. I, see, I still do, yes. But I occasionally take a day off now. What were you looking at exactly? So I started with, because I didn't know any different. I started with three bedroom, two bath, two car garage, single story homes. 62, 50 square feet lots up to 8,000. I didn't know any different. I now get more, a lot more advanced, but I looked every day for 10, probably for the first 18 months at that criteria only. And I got really good at understanding what a bad deal was, an average deal, good and great, because I looked every day. Right? It, it takes practice, but you can do it. Yep. Did you use any other resources to get familiar with the market? No, I would, I would create lists and we would come down every other weekend and drive neighborhoods and all of that. But no, I didn't, I did, we didn't have Zillow. We didn't have Property Radar. We didn't have all this stuff that you all have today, right? I had Realtor.com and a two and a half hour drive to Fresno on a Saturday or Sunday, followed by a two and a half hour drive back. Didn't do bird dogs, didn't pay people to drive for dollars. There was no direct mail, hard lifting. I bought, the other thing that's kind of odd about our story is for the first 15 years, I bought everything out of the MLS. Everything. I had no buys from sellers. I did buy one thing on auction.com during the absolute crash. It was a Madeira duplex. But other than that, everything I bought was available to everybody in this room. I had no special access. I just worked harder. I might be one step ahead of you because I'm pretty sure you're going to get it. That's okay. It seemed like the right time. Sure. Um, we talked about something the other day that was really interesting to me. Yeah. You said if you would go back, you'd stop buying cheap properties. Yes. Get turnkey. Can you talk about that? We will. That is on okay. the slides. Thank you for bringing that up. Again, ask questions. That's, that, that right there is the worst thing that will happen is that's on another slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, we conservatively finance everything. So again, because I've been doing this so long, 
I saw people, and this is going to happen this time. There are some people that you know in your network that have been freaking killing it the last five years. They're living high on the hog. They got new cars. They probably have two or three new cars. They probably moved. Right, you know who I'm talking about. I know some of you know who I'm talking about. When this thing turns and they're highly leveraged and their shit really don't cash flow, they're going to lose it all. I knew people that were worth $10 million with out-of-state properties that once this turned and those first couple of dominoes fall, they couldn't get out of the way. They declared bankruptcy and lost everything. More than one person. So remember what I told you earlier? Uncomfortable truth number one, sacrifice. Right? Don't be that person. Because seller's markets change and that good times will end. Be, cons be conservative. Yeah. I know you just look for a yield when you're buying property. Do you have a certain amount of cash flow? I know you get this question all the time. But you're no. Yeah, so what I, so um, this is a whiteboard, right? Yeah. Do we have pens? Um, is there any right there? Anybody have one in the Thank you. So I'll actually do this at the end. I'll actually give you my equation at the end. But just what it is briefly is I want to know how hard my money is working. So it's a very simple equation. I will generate it. I don't know if that's going to erase. So it has that to be. That is not a dry erase. I'll let somebody else look. <laughs> this is, see, this, I'm the talker and other people do stuff. Um, so I want to know how hard my money is working. And um, so how much money does it take to get going? What's my expected yearly cash flow? I want that to be north of 6%, somewhere between 6 and 8%. Again, we're buying in California, people. This ain't Cleveland and Detroit. So that's what I'm looking for. I don't, I call it yield because, yeah, I don't want to get into other, I'll give you my formula. It's like cash on cash, but not quite. Um, some people call it cap rate, but I'm going to show you the math and you call it what you want. Uh, I don't look for like $100 a door or anything like that. I want my money working certain hard. I want it to go out and come back and bring friends. So that's what I do. Um, so one thing I did is we got out in 2000, and, I call it 2007, we had eight houses, actually seven houses and a duplex. And the reason we got out was because I came to a meetup like this. And I was like, I can't buy the ninth one. These prices in Fresno were stupid, right? That house I bought for 107, I could buy the one across the street for 270. But unfortunately, it still rents for 1100, right? It barely worked at 107. How the hell is it going to work at 270? What are these people doing? And everybody wants one. Some people want two. This is what was going on in 2007, right? Crazy. So a real, real estate meetup like this. Somebody came up to me and goes, hey, did you ever think about commercial? Again, I'm stupid. I go, I don't want shopping centers and office buildings. Right? Why would I want commercial? He goes, I remember the pat on the back. He's like, oh, Michael. No, we mean apartment buildings, and specifically small apartment buildings, five to 10 units. We, we actually found one, I think. Thank you very much. So what this meant was is you can commercial is a type of financing. So condos through fourplexes are bought with residential financing. Commercial is five units and above. Don't ask me why five. I have no freaking idea. It's the law, as far as I know. So what we did is we started to look at small multis. And what we found is multis were a lot better. So if you remember North Drive, we bought for 107, sold for 270. I already told you we bought Vassar, five units. We bought it for 220. We sold Norris for 270. We bought Vassar for 220. But here's the kicker. Norris still rented for 1100. Vassar rented for three grand. Does anybody see the problem with that? Neither did I. So I quickly did a 1031 exchange out of all of my houses at silly, ridiculous prices. And we went from eight units to 80 units. Because we took equity out. We did a 1031 out of houses into small multifamilies. But here's the deal. There was some chatter up front. I don't know if everybody caught it. I believe, and I have this later in the slides, that markets get nutty. So 2006 to 2008, single family housing was nutty. I believe because of Grant Cardone and the syndicators of the world that multifamilies are nutty, specifically bigger apartment buildings. Like stupid nut. I own some of these things, and I'm selling them now because people are paying 30% more than they're worth. For ridiculous prices. Just, and just, they're, they're looking at some of the C-class stuff I own 
and paying me like it's an A-class property. If you want to take it off my hands at that, I'll take it back in about five years when the debt resets. No problem. So again, markets can get nutty. And if the market's getting nutty, look elsewhere. So in 07 and 08, that meant look at the anything but a house. Today, I would not spend a second of time looking at multifamilies 5 to 20. I probably wouldn't even look at fourplexes, right? Because everybody and their brother is there. And here's the deal. There's like, for every fourplex, there's, I don't know, 30 houses. But if everybody's looking for fourplexes, the, the math gets silly. So that's my, and I have it again later, but that's what I think about multis right now. I think they're just insanely priced. And going lower, right? I mean, we're, we're talking Fresno in the fours now? It was in the sevens in 08. What, in the fours? That's like LA cap rates. Are you freaking kidding me? And, oh, come on. Are you at all interested or have you had any Airbnbs? Uh, I do not own any Airbnbs. I only have property in Fresno. I don't know if at least the stuff that I buy would qualify for Airbnbs. I have lots of people in my network that do Airbnbs, some in Lake Tahoe, some in kind of vacation spots. So I know about the model. Uh, I do not own any. that um, the people who wanted to buy the complexes you're thinking about selling and they were buying it for way overpriced, do you think they wanted to turn them into Airbnbs? Well, if they are, they're stupid because yeah. these are not generally in. There's a lot of laws cracking down. On exactly them. where I was going. Yeah. The Airbnb model, especially in California, is about to have a wake-up call right. because our legislation likes to, to get in the way. Yeah. and it's going to eventually get in the way and it's going to become less uh, attractive. So you would advise, advise against If you're going to look at Airbnbs, California ain't your place. Okay. It could work, right? You want to go to North Carolina, South Carolina, or Texas, places that are more business friendly? Yeah. It could work. I get it. Right? I, I get the model. I have, a, I have a buddy of mine that's all he does. He's killing it. Yeah. I wouldn't touch an Airbnb in California. <sighs> But like me and Kyle were talking about a guy, if you listen, if you got this from the Bigger Pockets episode, um, a guy who all of his Airbnb tenants are based off of construction. So as soon as the market turns, like everything's gone. Yeah. Like everything's gone. Yeah. And, that, and the same thing in Utah, like we've looked at doing Airbnbs in St. George, my family and I, and then we got a letter from the city saying that they're going to find us and give us a thumb. Yeah. Woo! That sounds like fun. Yeah, like just stupid shit like that. I'm, I'm not for Airbnbs. If you live there, you have a lot more. You're able to do a lot more, but from what I've seen, it's been pretty good. I, I know people are still doing it, even though, it, like, I think it's San Francisco. Yeah. People are buying a full apartment complexes and like, 10 tenants out mm -hmm. and making every unit an Airbnb. That will work un it until awesome. it won't work, and it won't work spectacularly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Very welcome. Uh, here's the deal. Again, I'm, I'm, I've been, oh, I'm sorry, did I have another question? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. I thought that was a back scratch. No, I was just going to ask you, uh, how do you feel about like, the whole rent control scare? Oh, that's a good question. So um, I actually did a podcast or a video on this recently. I'm not, that doesn't make me so nervous. Does it? No. So, so again, when the government gets involved, so, everybody, so first off, does everybody know that California in one of the houses passed, I think it was a 7% max plus cost of inflation. So it's basically 10%. You can't rate 9 or 10% based on cost of living. So you can't raise rents by more than Everybody know what we're talking about? And as a landlord, that, that should freak you out, right? Because they're basically saying dictating. they're dictating how much you can raise rent. But in reality, after owning lots and lots of units for lots and lots of times, I can't think of any year in history where I have raised an existing tenant's rent more than 10%. It just doesn't happen. If you move them in at market, that doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen anyways. Um, but here's the deal. Tenants are going to lose in this situation. Because I already told you I take care of my good tenants. Remember that story? One of the things I did for my good, good tenants, if you paid me every month on time for 12 months, I wouldn't raise your rent. But now if it passes the second house and the freaking government gets in my way, I'm going to raise rent every year because I'll never get it back. So the tenants, my good tenants will lose. Now, I will be sensitive. I'll raise it half as much as I could and all that stuff because I want to take care of them. But the government is telling me to raise rent every year. That's what it says. 
It's stupid. But if those are the rules, I can't argue the rules. I'll play by the rules. So it doesn't bother me at all. I know you've moved off of buying multifamilies, but when you buy them, yeah. and then say someone is way under market rent, and yeah. so like the deal I seen earlier in the year, one yeah, yeah. like those six units, yeah. kind of like $300 on the market each one. Yeah. So as you're going to go and like... So let's just do a pretend, right? Let's say there was a 10-unit building on Lamona. Oh my god, I own one of those. Uh, and they are 500 rent when they should be 750. Everybody following me so far? Right? And you buy that, or I buy that, and that's what the situation is. So first thing is, you can't go in and raise rents from five, you only can raise it 50 bucks. That's 10%. Easy math, right? Here's the loophole. Yes. You give them a 60 day notice because they've probably been there longer than a year. They have to leave. And then I go spend $100,000 of capital improving the property. And then I rent them all out for 750. So you just anticipate it all front. You have to do it all up front. But here's the deal. This has always worked. One of the things you'll see later is I made a mistake of buying cheap properties. Let's like this 10plex. And here's the deal. If you try to take a tenant paying 500 that should be 750 in a building that's worth 500 and you try to take them to 6, they are going to not pay their rent. They're going to force you to evict them and you know, 90 days later they're going to leave anyway. The building's not worth 600. Just because the market says 750, the building is a slumlord building. It's been undermanaged, undercapitalized. The building sucks. That's the landlord's problem, not the tenant's problem. It needs to be improved. It needs to be brought back to life with 100 grand in capital in this example. So tenants are going to, unfortunately, some tenants are going to be asked to leave. I know you're not an attorney, but yeah. are you able to evict a tenant and then have them sign into a new lease after a small period of time? Do you know? Well, why would you? I would never, I would, if I had to evict somebody, I would never rent to them again. So I'm not, so that I'm doesn't even compute. Just so that you can, just so that you can increase. The I would never game a system. I would, I grew up dirt poor. I would never do that to someone. If I want them there, I want them there. But if they're a 500 paying tenant, they can't pay for any more, they can't qualify, but I want to raise, I want to spend 100 grand to bring the building back to life, I'm going to go get 750 tenants. I'm going to give them a full 90 days to leave, mm -hmm. help them find some other place to live if I can. Mm -hmm. But no, I would not play that game. Okay. Yes, sir? Uh, I have a question. So yeah. Your yeah. Uh, what's like a typical uh, realistic vacancy factor? Ah. So I'll answer that question this way. So I have, let's call it 50 houses and I don't know, whatever it is. Call it 150 apartment buildings. Here's a question for you and use these numbers. What do you think the average tenure is of my housing, people in my houses? Meaning how long do they stay on average? Five years. That's fair. Assume, assume they're B tenants. Five years. You know, 50-50 cash versus Section 8. They're eight years. Eight years is my average house. Because people want to live in houses. They want to have a yard for their dog. They want to, you know, a place for their kids in the backyard, all of that. Mike, guess what the average is for an apartment building? Two and a half. Average turn for a house is about 7,500. Average turn for an apartment building is about 3,500. Start playing with those numbers. And you can very quickly realize that housing is typically a better investment. So why are you in so many apartments? Because when I bought them, the market was different. Ha ha ha! He thought he caught me. <laughs> yeah. No, remember the statement here: multis were cheaper. Yeah. I wouldn't do it today, though. But that's a, that you're, that's how my brain works. So, are you disposing all your? I have listed three of my largest buildings at thirty percent above what I believe they're worth, and two of them are in escrow to close in the next two weeks. Awesome. Did one of them already close? One already closed. And yeah. you got it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got one I wanted. Yep. What, and you just bought more houses. I'm buying houses. That's what my math says. Buy houses. Yep. Uh, so that, that uh, number that you gave, that figure, does that change depending on the class of the, of the unit itself? Well, it's a, yeah, I mean, I own, you, could, you can assume all my stuff is B, B minus. And if I, I have bought C's, but I upgrade them. I put in the granite and the, the flooring and all that stuff. I want to keep everything about a B. If you think of the Monopoly board, I want to be that red and orange. I don't want anything like Marvin Gardens, that yellow and whatever that is down the other side. I don't want that, and I don't want purple and light blue, if you think about the board. Okay. What's your rule about the neighborhood? <laughs> the, 
So I have this rule about, because again, I don't know Fresno, right? So um, <laughs> he's asking a question he knows the answer to. So um, I have a rule uh, that if I'm willing to buy the house, if I'm willing to have my wife, who's a little, she's a little thing, um, co go to it by herself, get out of her $100,000 vehicle, go in and check it out, and not feel like she's going to get carjacked when she comes back out. Yeah, if, if it, even if the house is free, I'm not buying it if that's the situation. That's kind of my criteria. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll buy in some, you know, and again, that's during the day. It's not midnight. I'm like 1 p.m., 2 p.m. Like, we're talking midday. <laughs> we're not talking 2 a.m. stuff. That's, that's a different level. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. Come on now. So another thing that I believed in the beginning is I believed banks would always lend to me. I had a six-figure job, an 800 credit score, and money in the bank. Guess what happened from 2009 to 2011? No, no bank would lend to me. I was the enemy. I, would, I felt like when I walked in the Bank of America, alarms would go off. I mean, I just felt like the enemy. That's how they treated us. So you have to find other ways. And I have a slide just on raising private money. Um, because I got pretty good at that. I used hard money first and then found private money even better. So we never stop looking for deals, hence the story of one at a time. My goal through all, all of this is to make my next purchase better than the, the one I just did. That's kind of a mode that I've always had. Right? And, and I got pretty good at, at doing that. Um, the other thing is because we had this crazy busy life, trying to raise our daughter and keep her safe and sane, we outsourced everything. We had property managers since we had one house. We paid 10%. Right, we don't pay that today, but that's what we paid in the beginning. We outsourced contractors, painters. Yes, I did come paint a unit one time just to prove I was a man. I'm freaking never doing that again. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> but again, so we outsource everything. So here's the deal. If you're new and stuck, this is where you take out a pad of paper and write down these questions, because I believe you have to be able to answer three of these four. What is your buying criteria? This kind of feels open-ended. Some people will say, you know, I want a 322. But really what I mean by buying criteria is what will you say yes to? Is it cash flow per door? Is it a 10 cap? Is it something 50 grand under market? What is your buying criteria? Because until you can tell me that in 30 seconds or less, you're going to spin your wheels or Waste money because you're going to say yes to something that doesn't make sense. And I don't think either of those options are good. If you're going to, if you're going to just spin your wheels and do nothing, then go do something else. If you're going to just say yes to the first thing that somebody, that Scott, comes by and says, this is a deal, buy it. Which you should. <laughs> no, you shouldn't, <laughs> unless it fits your buying criteria. Right? Everybody get that one? And again, it can be your buying criteria. If your buying criteria is, I want a yellow house on the third street of, with a vowel in the name. I don't, whatever it is for you is you. That's your buying criteria. Nobody should talk you off of it. Okay, so if you know your buying criteria, what is an average deal in your market? Let's just say that your buying criteria is you want 10% on your money. Let's just say. If you want 10%, what is an average deal in your market? Is it eight? Is it seven? Is it four? What is it? So take your buying criteria. Like I told you earlier, I looked every day for 10 years. I got really, really good at understanding what my buying criteria is and understanding and processing out 98% of the deals because they were, they were below what was a good or great deal. OK, so if you know what an average deal is, what's a good or great deal? So again, using the 10%, just because it's a round number, is a good deal 10%? Is a great deal 12%? What is it? You do not spend a freaking dollar until you know your buying criteria, what an average deal is, what a good and great deal is, if you follow what I teach. OK? Because otherwise, you are gambling. And that's not how you get rich in this game is by gambling. Okay? And then the, other th the last thing is, I added this question later, is you need to figure out what you are uniquely good at and outsource everything else. You stop being a control freak. 
Stop wasting time on things. I should never have painted that unit. Yeah, I wanted to stroke my ego as a man. It was the stupidest thing I could have done. I could have been looking at more deals. I did a horrible job. I'm sure they had to repaint it after I left. It's dumb. So figure out what you're good at and be comfortable outsourcing the rest. Anybody have questions about these four? These are important for new people. All right. Works for me. Yes, sir? For buying criteria, you've always talked about digging deep into one area, not wide. Yes. What's, what is your reasoning on that? Because, again, I have a very busy day life or day job when I was doing this. Mm -hmm. I could only focus on so much data. Right? The MLS, when you're looking at 322s, probably has 12 or 1,300 listings if you right. looked at everything. Right. And I couldn't process that and adjust for the daily changes. Right. So I had to go, OK, 322, got it. That's all I've ever lived in, so that's what I'm going to look at. But Fresno's huge. It had you know, 800,000 people when I started, or 750. I'm going to look at two zip codes. Because now it goes from 1,200 to like 120, and sometimes 80. I could look at that in 12 minutes or 15 minutes, and I could see what changes. I could see price drops. I could see stuff come on, come off. It's just a lot better way to learn. And when you do that, it becomes very easy to go, OK, now I'm going to look at four twos. OK, I'm going to go back to three twos, but I'm going to go to another zip code. Right? You can very easily build off that. If you just looked at everything, Data overload, your human brain can't do it. My day job would mean I'd lose half of that stuff. It'd be so focus is good. Are you looking at pending and sales as well? So you have an idea of what things in the beginning, no, I couldn't. In the beginning, I didn't even know to do that. I just looked at what was available. Would you do that now? I would look at that today to see what things are actually yeah, possible. coming on, come off. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but it, I didn't do that in the beginning. I would though. Uh, if you guys are wholesaling, take that same approach for your marketing. Honestly, a lot of people try and go all shotgun, shotgun everything. <laughs> Pick a zip code, pick a criteria if you want to go single family homes. We could narrow it down to three twos. Single family is only 93706 after exactly. Yeah. And then start there. Learn, learn, right learn, there, learn. Market there. Because at this point, wholesaling is real estate, it's all marketing and sales. Correct. So I'm kind of confused with your uh, what is a good or great deal. Cool. In your awesome. Market. Let's do it. Because when you say, you know, because pretty much we're saying that the market's going to dictate what's a good or a great deal. Whereas if we say everyone, in a sense, is, is going after multifamily right now, which you think is a bad investment, mm -hmm. but the market tells you that's, a, you know, what you just sold yours for is essentially like a good deal. It's a great deal for the right. seller. It's a horrible deal for the buyer. But, but, but you get what I'm saying? I feel like the market will lie to you, in a sense, if you're talking about what's a good or great deal in the market. Oh, I hear what you're saying. I missed it. He's looking at the sales and saying that ah. it's sold for that doesn't mean it's a good deal. What is it? It's based on your buying criteria. Yeah, right? yeah it's so based like, on your buying what, criteria, yeah. What type of yield do you want on your money? <laughs> yeah. So like, what do you want like in return? So I want an 8% return on all my money regardless. I don't care where the market's at. Like, because it doesn't make sense to have, it's like having money in a savings account pretty much. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be making any money. So unless you're making 8% on the money, you won't buy it. Right? Yeah, well, here's the deal. Let's, let's play with that. Let's say that you're, let's just play with this example. Let's say, because this is what it is for Fresno today. If you take list price, and the rents that are available, again, using Section 8 caps and all of these other areas, just assuming that. Today, Fresno is about 55 to 6%. Assuming you pay list, you're buying turnkey stuff. So let's assume it's 6 for easy math. That's average. OK? Now let's say you only want good or great deals. And we'll just use 2% differences. So a good deal is 8 and a great deal is 10. So how do you do that? You either go to an average deal and offer less. You find a way to create value and create more rent. Maybe there's square footage that can be repurposed as a bedroom or something. Or you find multiple houses on one lot. There's ways to create value, or you just have to offer less. So if you find a good deal, which in this example is 8, and you only buy great, which is 10, it just means you have to offer less. And that's where, that's where it helps having a skill of wholesaling. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you can repurpose. Yeah, if you only add 10 percenters to your personal family's portfolio, but you're willing to sell off eights to others because they want sixes, you're going to freaking kill it. Brilliant. Brilliant strategy. Multiple exit strategies, home run, your hero, you're going to leave teaching next year. You're everybody's best friend. <laughs> okay, early mistakes. This was a question earlier I think Scott asked. I was too laser focused on cheap properties. This is important. There's not many things I say that are important. This one's one of them. So how many of you have been told you're supposed to buy under market properties? 
That's what I believed. Right? Let's use some numbers. Let's say the house is worth 200. If you can get it for 150, have you won? Well, then this guy will say yes, because you got 50 grand under value, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking fixing it up, refinancing. That's exact. Now you got it. No, that's what. See, so you were you were naturally right. Here's the problem, and I made this mistake on all of those first eight properties I bought. I made it every time. I bought properties for 20 to 30 grand under value. Because if I spent 15 grand, I can get 15 grand in artificial equity or forced equity on that bullshit that Bigger Pockets talks about. Everybody know? But here's the problem. I just wasted a shit ton of cash. And when I started, my constraint was cash. Let's use some examples. So that hundred, let's just use Norris Drive, 100K house. It was 107, but we're going to use it 100 grand. Let's say it was worth 125. I already told you earlier I had to put 20% down, right? I, did I have to? No, but that's what I did. So I put 20K down. Let's say I spent an extra 10 grand the first time. We're not talking about the guy that destroyed it. But let's just say I put 10 grand. So I'm into that property $30,000. If I would have bought a house for 125, perfect, already done, cleaned, no make ready, I would have only had to put 25K down. No make ready. I made this mistake over and over and over again because I wanted cheap. I was looking for cheap. I wanted to buy an undervalue. I wanted to, you know, it wasn't called Burr when I started, but I wanted to Burr. I wanted to get all this forced equity. I wanted to add to my net worth. I fucking can't spend my net worth. Right? But cash matters. And I burned my cash. I would have been twice as big if I would have bought clean versus cheap. And that is hard to rationalize, but do the fucking math. Right? But those deals are hard to find. They weren't back in. Oh, back then. Yeah. Now. Remember when I started? Yeah. Do you, have you looked into any subject to, I don't, I don't know if you're doing that much of your own marketing. For I don't do any of my own marketing. I don't have a team. I have friends like you who call me with bullshit deals. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it's my buddy. Um, no, I don't, I, I've looked at subject two. I would consider doing them. Um, I would consider any creative way to help a seller out if I could find a way to profit and hold long term. But again, remember my model. I only do two things. I buy and hold forever or, you flip or, I, or I buy ugly and I flip the turnkey. That's all I do. I don't believe in adding extra stuff. Like there was a time in my life where I bought lots because lots were on sale and I profited from them. But I don't want to get the city notices and the, get, bring out the trap. Nah. Do what I do. Focus is good. Move on. Would I be opposed to learning subject two? No. Would I be opposed to learning probate? No. But this is, these are my two models, and they got to fit in that box. Uh, I just want to be clear. So when you, when you talk about cheap property, are you referring to something that requires a lot of? Fixer. Fixer. Yeah, so ones you look at, kind of livable, but needs a new kitchen, bathroom needs to be updated, right? For 25 grand, you can raise the value 40 grand, right? So you get this artificial 15K pop. Feels good. Freaking burns a lot of cash. So, sorry if I'm confused. No, please. Does that make sense? I, I know you said like you don't like the burn method. No, well, I didn't. Well, you Fair enough. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, with the burn method, you can pull out all of your cash. If you buy it, right. Right, yes. So, how did you do it not using the burn method and just putting 20%? Down each time and not yeah, so, so we did, so the first one we bought, we did 20% down. The next two we bought, we did 10% down. We did an 80% first, 10% second, 10% my equity. Our cash was gone. But by that time, a year and a half had gone by, and again, we were in the last seller's market. So we went back to that first property and did a cash out refi. They handed me $50,000. I went out and bought two more properties. By the time I did those two, I went back to the second one. I did a cash out refi and bought another one. That's how I did that. So it was great. Like, you timed it perfectly. I was lucky, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I did not appreciate my cash. This was a big thing. It's kind of saying it twice, but this is the real deal. I only had, I started this whole financial freedom with 40 grand. I understand that's more than some, but it is a lot less than a lot of people that I know in this game. I only had 40 grand. That's all I had to my name on my 30th birthday. That's all I had. And you know, we, we built it from there. And again, timing and cash out refis, 1031 exchanges, all of that. Here's another one. I didn't appreciate return on time. Here's the other deal about the Burr method specifically, or buying cheap properties. 
not only does it consume cash, but as somebody who has a worldwide responsibility and is on an airplane too often, the other thing you don't appreciate is all the time it takes. You got to do this, and this gotchas, and this change orders, and this window broke and had a break in, and somebody stole the door, stole the door uh, threw a rock through, BB through the window, and return on time. Think about return on time, especially if you have a full-time job, especially if you have family responsibilities. Remember, you can get sucked into something that is not right for you. The Burr method is awesome. I posted it today on Bigger Pockets. It is awesome if it fits you, if you have the knowledge, if you have the experience, if you have all of this. But if you don't live in Fresno, you're on the freaking other side of the planet half the year, it's probably not the right model for you. And you know no one. However, if you live here, you have a GC in your back pocket like your dad, it's probably a good idea, right? I'm with you. Good job, dad. Help your boy out. <laughs> the other one was, um, I always assumed banks would be conservative. I've actually, one of the things I got known for is this thing called no alligators, because I thought negative cash flow wasn't hard enough. Everybody know what negative cash flow is, right? It's basically a property that eats part of your paycheck, right? You have to go to a day job for it to pay. I assumed, and I already told you the answer, when I did my cash out refi on my first property where they handed me 50 grand, that the bank would be conservative. And I thought they wouldn't let me produce a negative cash flow property. Nope, they were happy as hell to loan me as much money as I can because I had a six figure job and they knew that I would pay for the delta out of my own pocket. I am a cheap, rational bastard, and that fucking killed me every month, writing an extra $200 to pay for my stupidity. Don't buy negative cash flow properties. Don't buy them. Don't create them. They kill you every month. And here's the deal. The people that lost $10 million in equity lost because they had too many alligators. It got to a point where it, even though they had the money to pay for them, it just didn't matter because they were whacked in value to 50%, and they're like, it'll never come back. They're, they eat up $250 a month, take them. <laughs> Gone. Okay? Anybody tell me what time it is? How are we doing on time? Okay. 8 o'clock, perfect. Yes, sir? I'm um, just curious, what specifically caused your first property? I refied it for too much money. Let's just say it was worth 200 grand. I took out 150, which meant that my original loan of 80 was paid off and they handed me $70,000. I now paid a higher rate because my purchase money interest rate is lower than my refi cash out rate. And pretty soon I'm paying $1,200 a month on a 1095 house. I thought the bank would never do that. I thought banks were freaking conservative. Nope. They are not as conservative as I was led to believe. Now commercial banks, they are conservative. Mm -hmm. All these syndication and LPs and GPs and all this stuff, those people are going to lose are the LPs. They're going to be asked to hold their money longer or take haircuts. Those commercial lenders are going to be just fine at 60% of LTV. Those, those, whew, those LPs, they're in trouble. I didn't appreciate that markets would take certain asset classes at different times to ridiculous highs. That house on Norris Drive should never have been worth more than 175. It went up to 270. The rent never changed over five years. Stayed at 1095. It never made sense. Today, apartments are ridiculous because everybody wants to be Grant Cardone and bigger is better. There's just not that many of them. And there's thousands of people listening to this guy every day. Everybody I, you know, like every third person I meet is a syndicator. Not good. It's going to happen. It's going to be ugly. And the LPs are going to get crushed. And an LP stands for limited partner. They're essentially the equity piece of a deal. They are going to take big haircuts or have to have their money locked up for decades longer than they thought. Mark my word. It's going to be ugly. So core beliefs. Again, Olivia, I would say, Olivia, this one's for you. Make sure your significant other, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, 100% on board. If you don't know if they're 100% on board, tell them a version of the Norris Drive story and say, honey, what would you say? If the answer is, great, let's do it again, you got one. If the answer is, ooh, that hurts, let's not do it, it's risky, move on or keep talking, one or the other. Never buy or create an alligator. Never buy makes sense, people get that. Don't buy stuff that, you know, it, it, that's negative cash flow. But don't create them either, and I made that mistake, because I thought banks would be conservative. 
Here's one. Live where you want, but invest where the numbers make sense. Right? I happened to, at the time I had to live in the Bay Area, all the tech jobs and blah, 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 blah. But invest where the numbers make sense. Right? For me, that was Fresno, and I'm, I'm happy I'm here and I'm staying. I believe in only buying affordable housing. Does anybody here that's not a real estate agent, so realtors don't get this because you probably know, what is the median home price of Fresno County? $250 Bingo. Are you an agent? You're not licensed. No. All right, that's good enough. It's 260, 259, 263, somewhere in there, depending on how you watch. That is a number you should be tracking quarterly. It doesn't move a lot, but you should always be asking yourself, if you're going to invest in Fresno, or if you're thinking out of state, you need to ask yourself, what is the median price of that market? Always know that. I want to invest below that, and likely 20% below that. So 200? Yeah, 200 is kind of my number. I want to produce in product that is sold for 200 or less in my slumlord to pride of ownership, but I'll only buy stuff below the median to add to my rental portfolio as well. Is that for easy getaway? What's I want multiple exits. Okay. I want to be able to sell to homeowners and um, investors if, you have to sell. if you I feel, have to sell. you feel comfortable at 200, you could cash out your whole portfolio pretty Oh, much. absolutely. I could, I could if, I, if I chose to, now I would never do this because some neighborhoods would have lots of for sale signs, but I could unload everything. I think everything would be in contract in 15 days. Damn. It's because everything's affordable. You don't want park place and boardwalk when the market changes. I have lived through a full cycle. Affordable housing always has buyers. Be, protect yourself. If you, here's the deal. There are some people in here, and maybe people you know, flipping Fresno homes in the 400s. Yeah. Yeah. If they haven't been crushed already, they are about to be. Their hard money costs are going to go up, their hold times are going to go through the roof, and they're going to lose their ass. So last time the market crashed, it was negative, right, in one year, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this time around, what, what do you see? For the medium single family homes? No, the, the crash. Would it ah. be much of a crash? Well, there's a good, there's a interesting debating topic. How many in here think the market's going to crash? And we're talking about single family homes, not apartments. What do you define by a crash? 10 oh, let's say 20%, because last time it was 50. No. 20% or more. 20% or more. Anybody think Fresno is going to go down 20% in the next two years or less? I think it will stay uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, Yeah, so 20%, 30%, 10%? Thank you. In two, yeah, two, I'm picking a number. Two years. If you, three years. I don't care what it is. Here, here's is what I think. And again, I've invested through a full cycle. So here's the riddle. What really caused the crash last time? Subprime mortgages over lending. Yeah. Lending caused the crash, right? And it's because everybody had liar loans and two and 28s, and you could just watch the foreclosures when the two, and, when the two year period ended and went from 1.9 to 7.9. These are interest rates fixed. You could see them roll over. It was, I mean, like, you could watch it drum roll in the MLS. What is different today? They've cracked down. There are, well, until very recently, there are no liar loans. They are back very recently, which is kind of scary. Consumer confidence is still down. Consumer confidence is still down. So what's different today versus, oh wait, liar loans don't exist? Everything's fixed. Everything is fixed is the big boy. When you have a fixed rate mortgage with a three or a four on it, It's pretty hard not to be good. Because if you even lo lost it, you'd have to rent somewhere, and you'll probably be above your mortgage. Mm -hmm. So I do not believe Fresno's median will fall below, call it 255, certainly below 250 in the next two years. So I do not see a 5% drop. And I believe the 5% drop will be a mathematical problem. Because you know what goes into the median? is all that high price shit. I think all the 400 and above is going to get clobbered. If you're selling 400K stuff, that could be 300. So that's a 33% hit. But I don't believe stuff priced at the median and below will be affected. And in fact, I believe it will appreciate. It's just the law of math. There's not many of these, and there's a bunch of these. All the new builders and all those folks. So I believe if you have something in the 400s and above, you could see a 20% price drop. 20, you could see 25%. 
But I believe that will be washed out by the folks below the median getting growth. Mm -hmm. So mathematically, I could see a 5% adjustment. But I think it's going to be bifurcated above and below that line. So I don't buy 400. I don't buy 300. That's my belief. Make sense? So understand quality difference. And again, I looked at the MLS, or again, Realtor.com every day for 10 years. I believe there's really three types of properties listed. There's the slumlord stuff. This is the stuff that is either boarded up or should be boarded up. Pride of ownership is the pretty stuff, clean granite, hardwood floors, two-tone paint, silver chrome appliances, whatever they're called. This is the stuff that cheap, well-used, but under-rented. This is the other one. This is what I got focused on in the beginning, and it can consume all of your cash. Now, you can split hairs and say there's variances in all of this, but when you're doing your math and you're learning your market, I would just start qualifying stuff. So you can say slumlord stuff's like this. Pride of ownership, pretty stuff's like this, and then you get used to what's in the middle. Make sense? Mm -hmm. this, your strategy is buy and hold. It is. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. buy and hold. I, I've created very little in my life, but I've created an acronym for CRAP. I like to shock people. I like to tell stories. CRAP stands for Cash Rich Asset Poor. You don't want to be CRAP. Cash Rich Asset Poor. Having a big savings account, big stock market account, I live in the valley. I have a lot of people that have RSUs and stock options, and they like to tell me how rich they are, but they're going to get hammered. The dollar is getting, you know, de it's getting depreciated. Interest rates, nothing in a savings account. Stock, if your money's in the stock market, good luck in the next business cycle, you're screwed. So again, you need assets that, have, that are inflation protected with fixed rate debt, tax advantage, all of that. So you don't want to do that. Always, always, always leverage conservative financing. The only reason we never lost a property during the crash is because we were always conservatively financed. No high leverage, we, everything cash flow except that first one, which again, we, we did a 1031 exchange. Be conservative. Don't, because when the market changes and the business cycle snaps back, it gets ugly fast. Focus on one thing. Again, back to one of those truths. Remember those uncomfortable truths? One of them is you only have to get good at one thing in this business. And for us, it was buy and hold. That's all we ever did. You don't talk to me about wholesaling. I, I couldn't even spell it. Direct marketing, forget it. Driving for dollars, forget it. There's other experts in this room. You want to talk buy and hold landlords of affordable housing? There's very few people that are better than me. Right? Here's one. Real estate's a people business. And if you're in this room, you get this. But some people don't. And I didn't appreciate this in the beginning. I thought the magic lived in Excel. Right? I was an accountant. I have an econ, an MBA. I thought the, the prettiest Excel spreadsheet would unlock real estate fortunes. My, my math is simple, and I told you I would show it to you later, but it's not. People business. I challenge you, if you're shy or you're just getting started, pick one of these two goals. Either meet one new person a week or two. Those are your only options. One or two. Seriously. If you can do that for 52 weeks, you're going to be golden in this business. Half my deals come from my network. Right? The other half's just out of the MLS because I'm still cranking away every day. We just signed an offer. We went into contract on something and just signed an offer before this meeting started. Still, still doing it every day. So why four rentals? So I've been, I've been gracious enough, been asked to speak at many events, some dozens, some hundreds, some thousands. And in the beginning, it was always financial freedom, 200 rentals. People would you know, smile and take pictures with you. But when, you could see it when they went to their car. They would say something like, we can't do that, or that's too big, or some other bullshit excuses. But as somebody who truly cares about helping people, that was a failure. If I can't inspire you to do something, I've made a mistake. So that's why I talk about four, because I believe four rental properties can fundamentally change your life. If you only ever get to four, I consider you a wild success, because four rental properties over the course of decades will fundamentally make your retirement better. It will change your financial future. It will help your kids go to college. It is that powerful. Okay. The other thing is, is anybody know how easy it is to finance four rental properties today? 
The first four are ridiculously easy. Fanny and Freddie will buy them all day long. When you get past five, you have to have reserves and seasonings and all of that. The first four are lickety split, assuming credit and down payment. Right? If, it, if, they, if the government says four is easy and they're going to buy them, take them. These are the 4% interest rates. People are starting today can get fours. Threes. Threes. Jesus Christ, threes. Crazy. Okay? So again, appreciate that. Get to four as fast as possible. Four rentals can change your life. What would cash flow be today? What would cash flow be tomorrow with rent increase? And tomorrow is years, right? Think about the future. What about appreciation tomorrow? And not tomorrow, years. What would it mean when stuff's paid off? Because again, I'm the buy and hold guy that holds stuff forever. Right? Yep. Do you put them on 15s or 30s, or do you put them on 30s and just pay paying them off 15s? I do 30s. Yeah, it's really tough in California, even Fresno, to get the cash flow off 15s unless you put 30 or 40% down. Yeah, I've always done 30s. There's a couple I've paid off early, but that's not a that's a personal choice. Yeah, but in the beginning, 30 years, fixed rate, go, go with God, go. Yes? Okay, so Kiyosaki said way back. Kiyosaki, yes. That's condo, yeah? Yeah. So my question Hawaii. is, as far as like with you, mm -hmm. um, what is the number of positive cash flow that you feel good about on any of your properties? So that's a good question. I don't look at cash flow for doors, but I get this question enough. I would be very nervous if my spreadsheet said less than $150 per door, right? Because I've been doing this a long time. I, well, no. So 150 is my net number. I've already taken out 5% for vacancies and evictions, 5% for capital reserves, all that stuff. Right? The 150 is the true net, net, net. Yeah, I don't, I don't fake it, right? I don't go, oh, my vacancy is zero. No, it's never freaking zero. Yeah. So I'm comfortable with 5% for vacancies. And vacancies and evictions. I don't do five and five. It's five for the... And then again, once you get, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Michael. Hey, buddy. If you, I have four right now. Awesome. Okay, so I'm thinking about. Congratulations, you're a success. <laughs> Yay. So sorry. I'm thinking about refining with, not, with no cash out, but flipping into a 15 year on one. Why would, okay. Because, so that one, my payment is 550. Okay. I pay 550, it's like 535. Yeah, whatever. And bring in 1200. Okay. And I'm not like, Year 27 or 26, I forget what it is. So you've paid three years. But I, you have okay. 27 years left. Correct. Okay. And so that one's at like four, I think it's four and a half, but I can get it at like four for a 15 year. You're going to have to pay a point, appraisal fees, document. You're going to be three grand into this thing? Uh, I would what? It'd go to like 750. I would bring in 12. So again, you're going to take a property that's probably cash flowing 300, three and a quarter net, net, net today to probably 100, 115. So on math, it look makes sense. I would wouldn't be worth the transaction cost. Take that three thousand dollars, throw it on the payment today, just pay it off earlier. What? Now, if you're going to take a payment from like, let's say you had private money at nine. So what about the other two that I have at five and three quarters and six percent? I can take them to 30 years at four and a half. And flip them back into 30 years. See, only reason I personally, again, this is one guy's opinion, so throw it away if you don't want it. The only reason I would do a refi is to pull out equity by my next property. I would never do a refinance to lower my payment unless it's like ridiculous, like $400 savings. I get phone calls all the time with banks that basically go like this. For $3,000, I can save you 75 bucks a month. I'm like, all right, my break even is like 36 months. I mean, that's what you're talking about, right, roughly? So, no, thank you. Now, if you're going to come and tell me, like, I have a commercial building, like I have an apartment that's at six and a half. Yeah. If you're going to refi me at four and three quarters and extend the term, like go the other way, and you're going to take my payment down $1,200, all right, now we can talk. But I'm not playing, I'm not playing for less than 75 bucks. Take the three grand, throw it on the principal, and be done in 12 years, my opinion. Now, if you want to refi... We find take money out, that's a different story. Would you do that in the right kind of market? I would Again, well, in the right market for the right deal, absolutely. Okay. Again, you gotta, you're in growth mode. Correct. I did cash out refis yeah. 
to go from three to eight properties, no new money. It was all cash out refis. Then I got to eight, the market was nuts. I couldn't buy anymore because my brain wouldn't let me. And then I did 1031 exchanges. I went from eight to 80. So I went from three with my 40 grand. From three to eight, no new money, only cash out refis. From eight to 80, all 1031 exchanges, no new money. So for 40 grand, you're in 80 units. 80 units. Yeah. Jesus. But again, let's remember, I'm weird. So when I did those cash out refis, I didn't buy a new car. We didn't upgrade our kitchen. My wife didn't buy a silly, stupid diamond ring. I mean, we, we sacrificed everything. Right. Everything went into rentals. Most people don't do that. They go, oh, I'm going to take seven grand and go buy a new motorcycle or whatever. Yeah. I'm weird that way. Yes, ma'am. My personal residence? Oh, okay. Mm. What, what is your philosophy on the so I'll answer it in two different ways. When we were in growth mode, so I lived in Silicon Valley. I've already told you that. Silicon Valley like, likes to appreciate. So we took over 200 grand out of our primary residence over the years, two different times, 100 grand, 100 grand, and used that to buy more stuff at different times. So first, we did use our primary as a piggy bank. Now that we've been financially free, we have paid off our primary residence. Yes. But that's, I have options now, and I have this, and I have that, and I like owing nobody nothing. But if I'm in growth mode, piggy bank. There's a, feel me? Awesome. Up. Oh, so what, do I, what would I do today if I was starting over? This again is a Bigger Pockets blog. It's actually a video that goes up on my YouTube channel Wednesday or Thursday. Immediately, I would, re I didn't do that. You thought this was that important. I feel you. That's awesome. Focus. First and foremost, I would live, I would slash my living expenses. We went from living on 100% of what we took home to 50% over about three years. That's fucking too slow. I would have gotten there in six or nine months. Cut stuff out that is stupid. Figure out what a need Cover your needs. Cover your kids' needs. I even covered some of my daughter's wants. No wants for mommy and daddy. Needs only. Everything else went in the bank. Because everything you can save, it allows you to earn, save, invest. I would increase my income. Again, in acquisition mode, do what you can to increase your income. Is that getting, a, yeah, it's hot in here. I'm, I, I'm very, I, I have a lot of hot air. I'm a sales guy. It's all my fault. Um, I would do whatever you could to increase your income. What this meant for me is I was a sales leader, which meant I made very little money because everybody had to make money until I made money. So I would quit that and I would go become a direct sales professional. Control my accounts, have the maximum risk, all of that stuff. I, if you're not in sales, maybe that's get a second job, work on the weekends, whatever you can do. Get a side hustle, whatever it is. If uh, I was starting over today, First, cut expenses, hard, fast, increase income. Yeah? Then learn my market. Put in the energy. Figure out what a good, what a bad, average, good, great deals are. Again, you're doing this at odd hours. I worked from 6 to 7 a.m. every day because my daughter was asleep. She didn't get up to go to school and get ready until 7. So daddy had an hour. Get after it. If you're a night owl, be a night owl. Put in the work. Step four, grow your network. Meet two people a week. Meeting people in this people business will bring you deal flow. Get your credit right. Get your down payment money going. Again, C.1 and 2. Then I would start making offers on only great deals. Scott. Just got, we just locked up our first deal together to show you what I mean by this. He wrote 73 offers for me until we put something in because I'm a cheap son of a bitch. How much should we get it for under asking? 50 grand under asking in the MLS today. Everyone in this room could have seen them. Ha ha ha, I've been doing this a while. What's the address? Uh, yeah. uh, 2797 uh, Newman. Newman. 
And it's two houses one side by one side. Property owned by the same family for over 200 years or something. <laughs> 90 years, yeah. Yeah, it was like ridiculous. Three bedroom, one bath, both sides. New roof on one. It's a beautiful deal. I'm going to sell it for 300. Keep your eyes open. Ha ha ha. Um, and then repeat until you're financially free. We sacrificed for 15 years. And I tell you this story, Olivia gets 100% of the credit. I don't know about you, but do you have some friends that like to show off? I live in the Silicon Valley. They always like to show me these new houses and these $100,000 kitchens and $50,000 bathrooms and seven series beamers and nutty things. This is the freaking toxic Silicon Valley. You have show-offs in your family or network. We did nothing. We drove 10-year-old cars. We lived in a condominium, three-story condominium since 99. We could have moved five times. Didn't upgrade anything. It still had the white subway tile. Stock. Stock. We were cheap. Earn, save, invest. Guess what? At 45, I left the rat race. I bought, can, I bought 20 years. What is 20 years worth to you? I think most people retire at 65, so that's what I mean by I bought 20 years. There are friends of mine that live in much nicer houses. Now, very few of them drive nicer cars than me now, but back then they all did. I win because we sacrificed together for 15 years. Make sense? So, raising private money. Who wants to raise private money? So I've been lucky enough to raise private money two different times in my career, uh, both times over seven figures. Today I have access to over two and a half million dollars any day I want it because of this process. You need to document everything you're doing. Document your story. And your, the story, the good and the bad. You go to a house, you lock it up for 120, it's an ugly house, it doesn't work, document the story. I found this house, I thought it was a great deal, we went and saw it, we backed out because blah, 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 blah. We find a fire burned house, we bought it for X, we put in Y, we sold it for Z, document your story. Good and bad, the whole story. Back in 07, 08, I wrote for Bigger Pockets as one of their published official bloggers. I would write articles. You can still go back, look me up, Michael Zuber. Um, I also had a site at the time called Wealth Building Pro where I wrote about every house I bought. The before, the after, the full story. Today, I would do it in video. Just document it, walk through. You can go to my YouTube channel one rental at a time. I post every day. Still, now I do it because it's fun. But document your story, the good and the bad. Share your success far and wide. LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, blah, 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 Snap, whatever. Understand the process. If you're going to go ask for money, you need to be a confident in how to do it. And not, not how to do it as far as money, but how do you create security for that individual that is likely in your personal network? What does title do for you? What does escrow do? What's a deed? What's a note? What is first position? What's second position? What are, what are escrow fees? Do you do interest only? Do you do principal and interest? What's the term? What's the prepayment penalty? You need to understand this lingo and, or lingo and vocabulary better than anyone. And when you do, they have confidence in you. And how do you do that? You practice. You take somebody in this network and you go, hey, you're going to be somebody that has a million bucks and I'm going to come talk about a deal. And let's talk about it. And it has to roll off your tongue. How do you do that? Okay? Network, 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 network. You never know who in your network may have money or may know someone that has money. And that goes to ask everyone. And I don't ever, I don't ever ask anybody individually unless they're really in my network and I know they've got money in the bank and they've told me. But I've always approached it in the beginning is, hey, I've been doing this for a while. I pay above average returns. You know, at the time, back in 08, it was 10% interest only. First position, very secure. We go through escrow and title. You know anybody that would like to earn 10% on a secured first position? Like, I would ask them if they knew anyone. Most of the time with the idea of, I have something. I want some of that. 
right? So you can always go around the fence, right? You don't have to go, hey, Bob, give me some money. Do you know anybody in your network that would like to earn above average return on a very secure investment? Just get used to that conversation. Okay? So what do we do now? So first and foremost, we're still adding to our long-term portfolio. We've added probably 20, 20 units this year. Uh, we are, if you're a wholesaler in this room and you want me to buy your stuff, which is totally cool, I've, I've paid wholesalers over 60 grand for a deal. Hey, good for them. Hey, I'm not going to judge nobody's money. Right? I've paid over, I've done as little as a thousand bucks, but I've, I've paid a couple of wholesalers 60 grand for deals over the last 18 months. But I, I look today usually for seller financing, if I'm going to keep it long term. Because I've been doing this long enough, I can structure it so it's a win for them and a win for me. I come in for less down, I have a shorter term, right? It's more flexible for me. But that's what I like to add to my portfolio today. Uh, I, wanted, I always come to Fresno anytime I'm asked because I want to network. I don't live here. If you happen to be hungry and you're looking to wholesale or bird dog or get referral fees and you want somebody who's got experience and can say yes in a heartbeat, I'm gonna, I have cards here. I'll give you my card. And you have my cell number, email. I come to Fresno. I'm not going to get home until 1 a.m. because I'm hoping somewhere in here is a deal this year. Somebody here is going to have one. And you're going to take my card and we're going to do business together. So I'll come back to Fresno anytime people ask. Uh, typically, something we're doing today is we're buying. Um, so I never flipped anything. I said that earlier, right? Except after I left the work, I have to be busy because I'm still type A. So now we buy ugly slumlords. We spend a bunch of money. I turn them into pride of ownerships, new floors, new granite, all this stuff. Uh, and then I sell them to usually Bay Area investors who want a fixed rate, no cost, total make ready called turnkey. Uh, we have eight projects currently in flight, actually 10 now, or soon to be 10. Here's something that I'm playing with. I actually own a building, an office building on Van Ness. Van Ness and McKinley, right? Yeah. It's cash to Fresno City. Yeah, right near Fresno City College. It's a gray building, white trim, if you drove by it. Thanks. Regency Thanks. property. I am seriously thinking about, because I own that building free and clear, I am seriously thinking about opening a real estate office there called One Rental at a Time, where I stock it with just real estate professionals, people in the business, to create an atmosphere of teaming. Not a brokerage. Not a brokerage, because I don't, I don't want that. Like an open space? Yeah, like hey, you know, general contractor in a space. I want an agent there for sure. Um, I want some wholesalers there. I want teaming. You know, we can mark. I'm willing to market. You know, do 50/50 on marketing. I'm willing to play, but I'm really seriously thinking about turning that into something called one rental at a time office or whatever. But I don't know what to do yet. You describe it as like a bitwise building, but real estate. Where you it's real estate only. People come in. I, I want. It, I'm not going to try to make a bunch of money on this. I'll, I want to break even clearly. I don't want to lose money. I'm not in that game. But I want to create a space where I can have people that I work with, I trust. We market together. We build. We grow. we got to help people. If you haven't figured out already, I'm big on helping people, sellers included. I'm not, if you're in this business to be a greedy motherfucker, I'm going to find you out. I'm going to crush you. You need to help people, right? So it's, I don't, I, I, there are some people in Fresno that are that type. I don't deal with them. Even if they bring me a deal, I won't deal with them. Um, but that's something I'm thinking about. I just wanted to put that there. So take my card later. If you want to talk, you want to go drive by it, go nuts. I think it's 1567 North NS. Anyways, doesn't matter. And then the last thing is, if you haven't figured out by now, something I do every day is post at least one video. And three or four of you have been on my YouTube channel. It's called One Rental at a Time. Do me a favor. Go there and subscribe. Just help me out. I'm over 2,300 subscribers now. I'm trying to get to 3,000. I'm a sales guy. I have goals all the time. So I post every day. But something I do is I do something called subscriber questions. All you have to do is pull up any of my videos, leave a comment with your question. Call it subscriber question, and then list whatever your question is. Hey, Michael, I didn't understand this, or I didn't do this, or give me a video on this. And I'm the only one that sees this. I have no virtual assistants. I have no direct reports. I don't want employees. I'm a simple person. I will, I, to date, I've created content for every subscriber question in under 72 hours. It's the way I, I, just how I roll, right? I got nothing else to do all day. We can beat that. Yeah, we'll see. All right, so go there, and if you have a question, and you like what I have to say, and you like the honesty that I give you, leave a question. Uh, I have documented my story. Something that I wanted to do uh, when I left was document our story. Uh, it turned into a book. 
I have some up here that I'll autograph for you. It's on Amazon. Go buy it on Amazon. It's cheaper that way. It's $14.99 on Amazon. I do have some here that I'll autograph, 20 bucks, because it cost me money to get them here. Um, if you want one autographed, 20 bucks is the best way you get it. But buy it on Amazon. It's cheaper. Um, but it is our story. It's the 15 years. I broke down our cycle into th four different parts. The start, the craziness of 08, the crash, the comeback, and then you know what we've done since. So there's a lot in there. Some of you have read it already. Yeah, started. Come on, man. Where's the audible? So, so I, I'm actually paying a guy to create the audible. All you people that do audible. Listen to it. Who's reading it? It's not going to be me. It's I'm no, dude. Come on. Then don't. Then I ain't going to do it. Forget it. It's just too hard, man. I tried to record a chapter. I'm just. I don't read well. I'm not very smart. Yeah, yeah. And then the last thing is, if you like this whole concept of learning your market, I did break down a course. I finally created one because people kept asking. You can go to my website, One Rental at a Time. Um, it's up there for $1.99. I do give you, because you gave me an hour and a half or two hours of your time, there's a coupon code so if you can save 50 bucks. Um, but that, again, is only for buy and hold. I'm, I don't talk about flipping or wholesaling. It's if you want to be a buy and hold landlord, learn a market, that's what's there. And that's it, I think. Yeah. There's my email. I have my cards if you want them, my website, and that's what the book looks like on Amazon.